Hi there, welcome to this afternoon's section on critical theory. Um, so I'm just going to give you an overview. Again, I repeat, like I uh, said in the video last night, you have three choices, four choices, really. You can follow the pattern and answer the activity questions in the forum and then meet with me at 4.30. You can work in groups. Um, I know a lot of you on PI are able to do that and chat online over the phone and do the activities together in terms of reflection and then post on in the forum as a group or you could do exactly the same but not post at all and simply meet with me at 4 30 for the debrief or if you'd rather work uh, individually and you find the activities are distracting you rather than helping you then focus on the the mac uh, text the taylor and medina text and the branded and Taylor, Brundit and Johnson, I think, text, and they will, uh, in the sections within this that deal with critical theory, and you will then simply meet with me at 4.30 to debrief, uh, make sure you've got a cool, cool, good understanding of critical theory. So you have four choices, but I'm going to go around this as if you were actually doing the activities. So we've got brain map still. Um, I put it every time and if it's ugly but it just means that we're still very up there we're in one of the four global theories we haven't started going down there by the hierarchy of theories yet so still this is the theory that you will find across disciplines you will find it in social work you'll find it in community work you will find it in uh, sociology you will find it in a fair amount of, of disciplines in science so the objectives for this afternoon um, we're going to look at uh, again the um, the media uh, sort of segments and see if you're able to see um, the theories they appear within those uh, those video pieces by the way as we get to wednesday we'll be able to go back on all of them and then give you a final answer because by then you'll be able to really see them so it's a first taster and then by wednesday you'll have all the language to go back through them and actually say okay that was definitely that that was definitely that here there's a conflict between this and that it's a slow introduction to that exercise and then after Wednesday we're going to get you used to doing it on your own so that you have one assignment where you're doing the same. Um, we're uh, also going to check uh, by then, uh, I'm recording this early, but by then I'll be able to be on your form one and then to check that everyone has ended their assignments and see if anyone needs any help. Um, I've also got a course glossary, so do, while you're doing this in the afternoon, I'm going to be um, trying to enter some of the vocabulary in the course glossary, because that will help you as well um, through the course. Here, we're all exploring still one of the four global theories, there's some branded theories that we talked about that we've identified as our compass, and it's critical theory. So the question we're going to be answering today is, what is it in this afternoon? And then as a, uh, as a follow-up, we'll also be looking at the, the sort of repercussions of in terms of choice of methodology that go with um, with the choice of critical theory as a as a, as a theory. Um, what is it? So you're going to be doing that part on your own. Um, we're going to use, as I've said now several times, the Taylor and Medina article and the Mac article, and then you go straight to the section on critical theory. And then I'd like you to set a brain map, a summary, basically. So posting in the first discussion form, um, the key elements that enable you to explain, imagine you're explaining it to someone else. How would you explain critical theory to someone else? Um, and in the plainest and the easiest in a nutshell, basically the easiest way you can do this. Um, and, and that should take you at least half hour, I would think. Um, and then we're going to go into a little depth and actually look at critical theory being applied. So this should take longer and should take you a good chunk of the afternoon. So at least an hour. So you have a, a text there, which talks about critical theory applied to sixth grade. So sixth grade is in England. So it's a, you know, it's a, I think it's in English, it might not be in English, but anyway, um, so let's say it's sixth grade, um, wherever it is, you'll see it in the context, um, in music education. So I've got four questions for you. What is the history of critical theory? What forms of oppression might there exist in schools? It's mentioned in the article. How might critical theory be used in educational research? And how is it used in relation to music education? This one's less important, but since this is what the article illustrates, let's let's tackle this one too. When you're tackling the first one, what is the history of critical theory? You have a section in the article that specifically describes the history of critical theory. You also have a video, a short YouTube video, which I've placed in the section, so you'll be able to use that as well. Um, really, the, my questions follow the structure, so they're going to be useful for us to be doing again 
um, a detailed map of what critical theory is, but you, you do have sections that are going to enable you to actually go through that. Again, you could do this on your own, and you could do this with, with friends if you want to share the activity, and that would be fine. I think you're going to find this, this really applied, and, and because it's through you know a study, you're going to be able to dissect the answers to the questions directly from the article itself. So I would think that would take you about an hour. Normally, we'd have done this in class in groups, but um, you can do it uh, alone or with others. Then there's going to be a discussion thread around methodology. So now you're used to this. We're doing this every time. I've told you that the, the choice of theory informs the choice of methodology. So it's important that we wait and that we, we stop and think about that. So think back to your 6110 course when we're talking about methodologies. Think of the choices, methodologies that you actually um, you know, were considering. What do you think would be a line between critical theory and a choice of methodology? Okay. Uh, then I've given you, as I've done every time, an illustration. I've given you two illustrations here. So critical reflective theory proposal for nursing education. An awful lot of critical theory in nursing education. Um, so it's not directly schools, but still you're going to see how it's applied to the, uh, to the context of a classroom. And then uh, another one for is social media for social justice in adult, adult education. So see how, again, it's not exactly schools, but uh, in terms of adult education in the abstract, how is a critical theory um, applied or intended to be applied? Those are just illustrations. So just read them on your own, and there's no need to, to, uh, to interact or discuss. Then I'd also want you, I'm not going to ask you any questions, but I want you to take uh, the remaining of the afternoon to also look at, uh, at these two notions because they're closely related to critical theory. The first one is critical literacy. And I know one of you was interested in talking about um, critical theory and uh, second language learners. So this might be um, a sub theory that uh, interests you. Um, what I've done is there's a journal article, which is open access. And if you want to browse the articles, just the, the titles and the kind of abstracts that I've submitted, it's going to give you a good, a good idea of what critical literacy is um, and see how it's developed as a sort of side, uh, you know, a side a subsection of critical theory. There's also a great TED talk uh, from Dennis Smith. It's very short, it's about 15 minutes. I really recommend that you watch this to, to get a further understanding of what critical literacy might actually be like. Um, it's explained in very plain terms, and I think you're going to um, really enjoy it. Um, and the second, I should have highlighted that, but the second subsection is critical digital pedagogy, which is a, a, a section that in an area that has been created, it stands on its own as a, as a theory, uh, but it's really a, a subsection of critical uh, theory. And... Um, there was a one of my colleagues, Bonnie Stewart, who was at UPI. It's someone you may know, uh, is one of the uh, of the leaders of that movement. It meets every summer. Uh, it's all across North America, and it develops basically. So let me give you the historical background. So when the technology, um, so critical pedagogy, I think you've had a course in critical pedagogy, and you've probably understand that it's about help people emancipate themselves and re empower themselves through the classroom when the technology uh, sort of emerged and, and boomed in at, in the beginning of the you know in the year 2000 around that time a lot of critical pedagogues started being really worried that it would widen inequity inequities widen the gap in society so that's why the word digital divide started happening right the great big fear for people who were concerned with social justice was that as theory uh, as well as technology emerged the, the gap would get wider and there would be haves and haves not. That lasted for about five or 10 years when there was a lot of writing in critical theory about the dangers of, of, of technology. And then it's kind of stopped because a lot of people started realizing that actually, hang on, yes, there was that fear, but in fact, in practice, people are using technology to also emancipate themselves. So there's a lot of work around, around you know, LGBTQ rights and technology and uh, you know, uh, even even if you you know you look at the work done at Ryanston, for example, with homeless youth, right? So kids on the street, it's not done face to face anymore. It's done through technology because we know that's the way to reach them. We understand people in mobile phones that everyone literally, however reticent you might be, but actually that most people will have a phone before they have a roof over their head, and therefore now when you're trying to reach people, you try and reach them through technology even people who are marginalized, even people who are oppressed, because it works very well. So the whole of critical 
theorists and critical pedagogues kind of flicked and decided, oh, maybe there's a great potential here. This is actually going to work. Critical pedagogy is then the re reverse. It's, it's after that movement of relaxation. They want to bring us back to considering whether technology actually harms in some ways. They're not saying all the time, but harms in some situations people who are marginalized or creates divides that were not there before. So critical digital pedagogues are going to be very concerned about, for example, um, harassment on social media. Um, Bernie Stewart, who I was talking about, had wrote a thesis about how uh, young uh, uh, instructors are creating a, a, uh, an identity and a visibility online through Twitter, but how they are also um, the victim of trolling and the victim of uh, racialization on, on, on media. So they are going to see all the benefits, but they're going to give us some, some, some warnings about, about areas that maybe we're not so conscious of, that are very uh, inconspicuous, but are very dangerous still uh, for certain people, in, in particularly people who feel oppressed or feel marginalized. So I have a look at that, but there'll be no question on that. But I think it's interesting for you as we finish critical theory that we look at that too. The other thing to know is that critical theory has actually sort of broken up. Well, it's not broken up, it's still there as a body, but it has created uh, as a sort of fragments many different theories that you might be interested for in for your presentation. So we have critical race theory, critical feminist theory, uh, critical pedagogy itself is a, is a branch of critical theory. So all of these are things that have emerged from critical theory and then can be related directly to, to critical theory. Okay, so I think it is, there's a lot there for you to, um, to explore. Uh, one more theme that we're going to uh, look at this afternoon is intersectionality, because that's a term that needs to be unpacked, and it's a term that's very specific to critical theory. It's only used in critical theory. So what is um, intersectionality? It has two meanings. It describes the process by which someone who's oppressed and marginalized feels and experiences that oppression on different levels of their identity. So someone who's oppressed in terms of race could also be oppressed in terms of socioeconomics and also be oppressed because they are queer or LGBTQ2S plus um, or indigenous as well. And so for them, it's not different things. It's all of these layers of oppressions coming together and sort of keep having, creating a combining effort to the lived experience that they have of oppression and marginalization. That's the first meaning. And so for a lot of people, when we talk about intersectionality, particularly women, it's that you're oppressed over women, but you're also oppressed as a, a woman of color, and you might be also a woman of color who lives in socioeconomically, uh, you know, sort of uh, challenged uh, sort of context. It has a second meaning, very different, when two groups who are feeling oppressed come together and overlap, um, have no, no nothing in common, no commonalities, they are not, um, you know, sharing anything else, but the feeling of oppression. And so they come together and they dialogue and discourse because of this shared experience that they have of oppression. But apart from that, they're very separate. So there's a good example of this, um, and it's quite fun. So you can watch the trailer, um, a film that was very popular in the LGBTQ community. It was a Pride. It's an English film that was made in 2014. And you, it's a good example of the second notion of intersectionality within critical theory. Um, there you see, it talks about the, um, the Thatcher years in the 90s and the great miners strike in Wales um, because Thatcher decided to, uh, to sort of sell off uh, and, and privatize and well, privatize lots of things, but just sell off the mines and close them. Um, and so the miners went on strike. It lasted for a long time. There was really a, a arm wrestling uh, it was a huge crisis um, and she stood the ground and refused to give in. And so they were sort of, uh, you know, in extreme poverty and, and even, you know, hunger uh, for many months. And the gay community, which has always been the target as well for Thatcher of, uh, you know, of political uh, efforts to, to limit visibility and things like this, came together and helped the miners. And so that's what the film is about. It's about inter intersectionality, these two groups coming together and actually um, having in common just that feeling. That, 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 that experience of oppression and marginalization. So it's an interesting uh, topic, intersectionality, and you're going to hear it uh, talked about a lot within critical theory. So it was really important that you had an understanding of what it was as well um, as we finish this section. So I hope you have fun this afternoon, whichever way you decide to, uh, to use to uh, explore this content. And I will see you at 4.30 for the recap. Uh, critical theory is very important. Uh, you, you're going to see 
in education, you're going to see lots of different sort of uh, manifestations of its importance in the classroom. So it's one that's worth worth exploring quite a lot. And it's one that's not super complicated to explain. I think when you're looking at the two texts and you're trying to um, define it, it should be fairly easy to define. And then I'll help you refine that definition and maybe um, describe in, in detail the, the, the process which, uh, which it sort of maps out. Okay, we'll see you at 4.30.